A discussion that we will uh, start in a minute. Moderating uh, Concha Roda and with the participation uh, with the participation of Imam Lozada, Gary Gautier, Marcos Fernandez, uh, Carmen Garcia, Luis Anoya, George Sturichi, and Imad uh, and a representative from and Imad Eljani. Doncs ella que vagi amb micro de mà i amb aquest senyor li posem el diadema. I si la moderadora va amb micro de mà... Jo preferiria al revés, perquè com que ells estan... No vull dir... Jo crec que si llavors hi ha preguntes a aquest senyor, només tenim un micro de mà a la sala. Llavors, després quan acabi... L'Oriol que s'encarrega de connectar-los. Sí, sí, sí. Jo vull veure la pantalla de connectar-los. La gent, Isidre s'ha instal·lat en allà a la sala de pilots i serà fins a les 12, no més. Llavors, presentes i ja està. Sí, bueno, però és que ara que els estic dient que ara si els dic això la gent sortirà. No, no, a l'hora del cofi. Ah, vale. Llavors, allà serà fins a... Que és a continuació. Eh? Ah, perquè veu. Live on time. No, not it. No, here, you, you need to sit uh, beside Aymat. Yeah, because this, this seat is uh, for uh, Karma. So, okay, and okay. Where are you sitting? Here. It is here. El mando ara el necessita la Inma, no? Ja me l'anirà passant. Vale. Sí? Sí. Com fa? La meva és la 3. El senyor Valentín. El Montfer. 
¿Cuántos años tienes? 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 ¿Cuántos años Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let's begin. We apologize for the delay and all the technology changes. This is the interactive museum session. I will introduce the different participants as they intervene. First of all, we will hear from Ima Lozada. She founded a company called Namaste, and they have developed a number of mobile technology. One of the most well-known ones is Moose Guide. Muse Guide. Ima has got an uh, IT degree and she has an MBA in as well, so she has also a business background. You have the floor, Ima. Good morning, my name is Ima Lozada. I have a technology business and I started working at MACBA, at the National Museum of, uh, at the Barcelona Museum of Modern Art. And I realized how costly it is uh, in terms of human resources to organize an exhibition in a museum. And then I also realized uh, the low impact that these exhibitions have. That's why it, at Moose Guide, uh, we decided to organize Moose Guide. Moose Guide allows us to enjoy exhibition at any time, from any place, from anywhere, on your mobile device, uh, on a website, and you can see this as, you can use it as a guide within the museum, or you can stay at home on your sofa or in a classroom and use it to have a, a virtual visit of the museum. For users, what are the advantages? First of all, availability. We all have a mobile device. We are all used to when we travel or when we go somewhere to enjoy the possibility of downloading apps so that we can gather as much information as possible. And uh, these apps, which uh, can be downloaded on the mobile phone, are scattered in uh, on your desktop. Well, with Muse Guide, you can find out about uh, the latest news, uh, the latest exhibitions, and it allows you to have on-time information and to download everything on your own device if you wish so. We can have different types of visits. For instance, we have the technology, and museums offer the content. This is the, this is what we realized. We realized that was uh, the best option. So you can have different visits. First of all, a traditional visit, multimedia visit with with text and audio and so on, or a visit where you can have different experiences with augmented reality uh, and geopositioning and so on. And gamification and so on. And uh, in that and in that way you can reach a much wider audience and you can bring in new audiences and you can build loyalty among them and in that way you can offer each visitor what he or she would like to see more adult uh, audiences would prefer to use this uh, rather as an audio guide using uh, video image and text but there are other younger users who would probably prefer to have for instance experiments uh, and different feelings different sensations In this case, we have developed different tests. We inaugurated this project uh, one year ago with the uh, Manac Museum and the Tapias Museum, and uh, we all uh, created the content with traditional content. Sorry, we brought in the content with traditional content, and with augmented reality, we were able to organize 
and bring together all the contents so that when you were at Manac at the National Museum of Catalonia and you were looking at one of the, you were focusing on one piece of work, you could also see all other works which were related to that one and were located in a different museum, in the Tapias Foundation. This was a different experience for users, of course. Based on this, uh, then we had other, well, we had some feedback on that, and some people in the audience would prefer to have the traditional visit, and uh, others would prefer to use this type of opportunities, this type of different experiences. We need to think that we are all used to this type of technologies, and young people, uh, well, even more than we are. So they want things which are different experiments and different experiences. Next week, we are going to attend uh, Gaudi's International Conference, and we were thinking about a 3D scanning exercise. This will be included in the app itself, so any project can be linked to MuseGuide. Uh, what does this, does this mean for museums? They can, first of all, have a, an app and a technology with a very low cost, no investment. They get rid of all the worries about uh, technology so they can focus on contents. Of course, contents need to be developed, but museums uh, have experts, tools, and materials to do that. And uh, a large part of the, a large amount of the work is already done. Museums, uh, museums uh, gain new audiences. They have the opportunity to build loyalty and uh, to bring in new audiences, probably younger audiences that uh, would not, they would not be able to reach out to. And uh, it's also, well, it spreads your footprint because anyone anywhere in the world can watch your exhibition online. These are the agents uh, making up the project. Oh, first of all, we have content generators, i.e. museums, uh, art galleries, uh, historians, uh, art experts, artists. They all can they can all bring their contents. And we also have uh, tourist agents, uh, corporations, hotels, and so on, helping us to disseminate all of this and to make this available to all visitors. And then we also have universities, schools. Uh, art lovers uh, and uh, tourists who are the actual users of these technologies. We work with different types of animations and 3D projects. And this is what we can include here. Isidra has already done lots of demos, so I will skip my, the video. And uh, well, we're here available for you for any comments uh, you may wish. Next. Eddie Gauthier, Gary Gauthier, he is the general manager of Casa Batlló. He has a training at Silicon Valley in California in uh, exponential techniques. While they're getting hooked up, uh, I didn't introduce myself. My no name is in the program. My name is Concha Gorda. I'm in charge of strategy and communication at the National Art Museum of Catalonia. You're all invited to, to come anytime. We have reopened after six months of uh, having the modern art collection closed. Uh, it was just inaugurated. We still have not introduced interactive interpretation elements. Uh, these technologies are not available at the museum yet, but uh, there's a second stage where we intend to enrich the museum with all these online interpretative devices. Also offline, of course, because we still have lots of users uh, which uh, prefer paper versions of things. And then we're going to run a pilot um, experiment uh, with e-beacons which are content facilitators, as we call them, based on location, proximity devices. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Gary Gauthier. 
after the wonderful presentation done by Zidra about available technologies in augmented reality, I would like to show you a practical example. This is a practical case. For those who don't live here, uh, Casa Vallo is one of the architectural jewels Barcelona uh, can uh, boast. Uh, this is a World Heritage Site uh, built by Gaudí. And uh, the summit of his uh, architectural uh, career, and he uses well the typical materials that he chose to work with, uh, like tile, and these uh, broken tile mosaics, uh, plus wood and iron, wrought iron used in a wonderful way. When we inaugurate, when we celebrated uh, the ninth uh, anniversary of uh, the opening up to the citizens, we tried to pass down to citizens all the legends uh, which have been generated about the Batlo house. Uh, it's nothing original. It wasn't create. They were not created by by Gaudi, but it's such a dreamlike house with so many references to nature that it has led uh, to the well, to people making up lots of lots of uh, lots of different stories, and we decided to do a mapping uh, on the facade. It took place uh, four years ago, and I'll show you a couple of images so that you get an idea of what I'm talking about. This is a sample of a number of sites or parts of this uh, Casa Vallo. And in 2012, uh, we mapped the facade. Uh, it was very popular. It rained. It was a, lot, a little bit of drama. This is the normal facade of Casa Vallo, of Vallo House. And one of the legends sa says that this is the Bones House. It symbolized on schools, skulls on the on the balconies and these um, tibias holding the building here and oldness and then uh, this column and the ribs and when you just uh, visualize this uh, people get a rough uh, a closer idea we will see that uh, an image is worth a thousand words uh, and uh, well we'll see what a video clip can do that. They also call it the Yon's house because of these open mouths. Others uh, saw these ulnas and tibias and bones. Other people think that there is a, a Batman here, a bat, sorry, a bat. Uh, and there is an allegory, allegorical story about this uh, Batlo house uh, that we managed to translate with uh, with a red thread you know that it's also known as saint george's house this is saint george's uh, cross saint george killed uh, the dragon which is there on the roof this is a balcony of the princess which was uh, well won over to the dragon and this these are the warriors uh, skulls those who died trying to kill the Dragon. So we organized these interpretations with uh, with with an argument and a plot, and uh, there's a wonderful video clip in YouTube. It uh, takes 20 minutes. I've shown uh, just a few images so that you have an idea of where we come from, what, what this is all about. Others saw the dra some saw the dragon. Others uh, saw the the hat of a circus artist. Uh, some people see confetti or circus elements. Basically, this is uh, as an introduction. Well, given, given the success of these video clips and uh, all this mapping, people were happy to see this secondary view of the building, this um, alternative view of the building. So. As this was successful, we decided to decode the inside of the building. You can't alter the, build, the surface, and so we decided to go for different technological solutions. But the idea was to try and decipher the inside of the house. Uh, but your house is full of symbols uh, and little details um, that refer to nature. Gaudi used biomimetics. Uh, 
There are lots of shapes uh, that remind us of nature, uh, lots of uh, natural inspir inspiration in nature. Some uh, is more further apart and more uh, of a fantasy. Others are clearly obvious. Uh, that's uh, the inside courtyard. As you can see, the inside courtyard reminds us of the bottom of the sea, and there are plenty of details giving content, uh, filling this history. Uh, this, uh, all these stories with content. This is the same courtyard uh, but seen from the inside, uh, from one of the main floors. Uh, this is a wonderful ventilation system. Uh, this uh, uh, little openings and uh, the eddy that it generates inside of uh, the courtyard, uh, it um, makes a, for wonderful ventilation for a time when air conditioning did not exist. And this is very similar to the branchiae of, uh, of, a, of a fish the gills of the fish. These are some uh, skylights uh, in floor one. It's not under the roof, but six floors down. And Gaudi managed uh, to bring natural light, uh, sunlight, into a building when uh, at the time was so important. And they have lots of symbols. Uh, this is the one that we have seen more often. And another detail, such as this one, so these are the doors uh, openings. It has uh, stained glass. It creates uh, wonderful light uh, games, uh, references to fossils. Uh, here we see a bony structure that um, embraces the main uh, staircase of the house. And it reminds us uh, of, uh, of a spine. And these are some of the details that we wanted to open up to the public, uh, to the general public, and we didn't know very much uh, how to do that. Well, but your house is open, it is empty at the moment, uh, and uh, well, there was a family living there. We have um, testimony of what they were, what it was like when they were living there. Uh, we have uh, images and re and remnants, and uh, well of the furniture. We can't put the furniture in because people would not be able to walk about. And we can only present that through photographs. But we decided to do a rendering project uh, with uh, all the furniture of the house so that people would be able to understand what it was like when it was decorated. Marcos uh, from the University of Valencia uh, was in charge of this project. So we, unfortunately, he's not here. Based on historical photographs, we decided to, to render all of this. We actually projected that on 3D spheres in a very plastical way. This is what it's like nowadays, and this is what uh, the family uh, was living when they were here. Again, we built uh, these uh, chairs. Uh, it was a huge amount of work, huge amount of research, so that we could use, offer this to users and see this, uh, make it seen, make it visible for for visitors. While Wow, so now we have all this information about what it was like when uh, the family was living here, all these references to nature. How can we offer this in a way that does not alter our heritage and so that it, it doesn't uh, hinder uh, people's uh, layout and people's uh, traveling around the building? We did a virtual visit of the whole building, so we, visitors have second layer of interpretation, 3D spheres, uh, uh, rend 3D rendering of uh, the furniture, 3D videos uh, of uh, with animations and augmented reality and so on. So the whole package is uh, is bundled up in a, in a small sample that takes only 15 seconds to watch. This project was uh, given an award at the latest Mobile World Capital Conference uh, as one of the best practices in the sector, and it's available to all of you whenever you visit uh, the Badlo House, Casa Badlo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I would like to give the floor to Karma Garcia. She is one of the founding agents of Marketing Cultural, a company 
which has developed a number of projects uh, for uh, mobiles, uh, uh, augmented reality, and uh, so on, among others, uh, for the Egyptian Museum and for the Mataro Museum. And probably the most recent one uh, is the one they have developed for MAGBA, the Barcelona Modern Art Museum, with, a, with an app called Art Two Dots. Yeah, this is a MACBA exhibition. It's not for a temporary exhibition, but it's rather devised as the MACBA Museum app in itself. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As Concha mentioned, uh, we've been working on a number of apps, uh, including augmented reality for a number of museums. However, my presentation will focus on not so much technical issues. We've been discussing them for one and a half days. We've seen different experiences about that. But rather, I would like to focus on how we need to think of these uh, apps and new technologies. How can they help us connect uh, and link up to our audiences? And with this bond with the audiences, we will be able to start explaining histories and stories and uh, knowledge to our visitors. The first thing that new technologies can offer is that uh, our offer can start before the visit. It will take place during the visit, and it can extend after the visit to the museum. And I'll show you some examples of the apps that we have created to see how we can include all these concepts. Here, we have the app we have created for MACBA and Casha Forum. This was for a temporary exhibition called Art Two Dots. In this exhibition, besides uh, thinking of all the content that visitors would find when coming into the museum, we also included communication about the existence of this app and the possibility of offering users uh, the opportunity to get to know the exhibition a little bit or to find out about the exhibition before uh, their arrival. This was uh, publicized as in the newspapers and users could start experiment and play with augmented reality in advance. Information about the app was given, information about what the person would find in the museum was given in advance as well through the newspapers. And this was done in augmented reality and direct recognition of images. If you focus uh, your device on, on the leaflet, you would see a 3D image of the building. And uh, there were explanations about the exhibition. The exhibition was uh, the door opening onto the exhibition. MAGBA and Kesha Forum developed a website for the exhibition specifically, and there was one chapter devoted to the app. So users were aware of the app's existence from the very start, and they could start uh, using the information contained in it from uh, their very beginning. Once the visitor arrives in the museum, we need to bear in mind that visitors often don't expect finding an app. So we need to, to have a clear interface with visitors. We need to inform the uh, visitors about the existence of this app. These are two examples of what was done in Casha Forum for this two dots app. And in all contact points with visitors, uh, this was explained and uh, augmented reality was introduced uh, to the audience. Uh, lots of people don't know about augmented reality. People know what to do with a QR code, but regarding augmented reality, you need to make things easier for people so that uh, users need to understand or learn what they need to do and how they need to focus, for instance, their mobile phones and so on. We need to make it easy, user-friendly and easily understandable for everyone. In the Mataró Museum, we had a painting exhibition and 10 pieces, 10 of the artworks uh, were included in uh, the augmented reality where you could find out more information about the piece or, or about the painting, author information, and so on. And for audience uh, being aware of what were, which were these 10 um, paintings that were included in the project, uh, we placed a sticker on the floor. 
As I said, dialogue continues after the visit. In the Mataró Museum exhibition, the exhibition was entitled uh, Mar de Fons, uh, Deep Sea. And, uh, or swell. In the leaflet, we already had uh, augmented reality techniques. Uh, you could download a slide, a, 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 a deck of uh, photographs uh, of the exhibition. And in the catalog that was published after the exhibition, there was also a certain interaction with augmented reality. If you were to focus your device uh, on some of the pages, uh, there were more information would come out with uh, audio information, video information, information about the, the paintings, and so on. Let's go back to what we said at the start. What do we want? We want uh, to tell a story, and technology helps us do so. Augmented reality, reality offers us the opportunity of adding layers of information to the real world. And these layers can be approached in different ways. So for instance, we can have tailor-made content. We can uh, customize language so that we can reach different uh, different targets uh, with different contents and different languages. This is an example of what we are doing for the Torre Valduvina Museum in Santa Coloma de Gramanet, in the outskirts of Barcelona. This is a tour around the town, and we can have a first layer of information, for instance, with audio information. However, we can go further than that, maybe through the route, through the itinerary, and the audio that you get as you walk down that itinerary. But here we also have image recognition. And with image recognition, we, those who wish to have further information can, uh, well, delve into this and get more info. This is another augmented reality project for the Egyptian Museum in Barcelona. This is a reconstruction of Tutankhamun's uh, tomb. If you, if you focus on that, we will have uh, three layers of information. First of all, informa uh, visitors get more information than what they would physically see in the museum. Here you see the different sarcoph sarcophages and the chapels making up uh, Tutankhamun's uh, tomb. There's also an interview to Howard Car Carter, uh, uh, some snippets of a radio interview. You can also go, uh, well, dig down further and get information on the different chapels. And there's also yet another level where you can get photos of, uh, of the archaeological site. Then you also have a more playful side to it uh, about uh, Tutankhamun's uh, fans. Here you can see, for instance, uh, some cartoons from the 1920s that had to do with uh, Tutankhamun. And uh, talking about uh, audience segmentation with the art two dots uh, application. Here, for instance, we have a, a work by Tapia, so we have information on, on how that piece of art was installed there. We also have access to the press clipping. And then we wanted to engage visitors into a dialogue, a dialogue in the social media so that we would find out what they thought about the contemporary art or modern art and do so through augmented reality. Then, let me add that we are trying to connect with our visitors through something which is part and parcel of their daily lives. We've been able to generate uh, enough uh, noise, enough uh, uh, communication so that the user finds out about the existence of our app, so that uh, the user downloads our app and so that it, he or she uses it during the visit. The next step, there will be yet another step. We want users not to delete the, the app from their device. Of course, we're taking up part of the device's memory, the smartphone's memory, for instance, and that's very valuable. If we are able 
to get users consider this app as something useful because it would evolve over time, that would be a plus, and we would keep this contact, this bond with visitors, at least with some of the visitors, because this, of course, will not be applicable to everyone who walks through our door. But we will continue tracing the or tracking the communication that we have uh, with uh, with visitors, and we will be able to build loyalty and find out much more about them. And that's all. That's all I wanted to say about my presentation. Thank you very much. Now, I would like to give the floor to Luis Anaya. He is the director of technology at the Catalan government's Ministry of Culture. And his department has collaborated in the use of augmented reality AR at the National History Museum of Catalonia. While we get this connected, let me open up uh, a small comment. The average age in this room is quite low. It means that there's a future for us. I'm someone coming from the university area with Artur Serra in 1995, who were dealing with uh, internet and video conferencing and things that we used to do in the past and which have become something common nowadays. I come from the university, I'm actually working still at the university, and I'm also one of the persons in charge of uh, technology innovation uh, at the university, not only in culture, but also in education, justice, uh, emergencies, and so on. So I'm a, a bit up in the air, in the cloud. But as a technology manager for the Ministry of Culture, I needed this being up in the air or in the cloud and needs to be translated into something more down to earth. Sometimes we're thinking, I think I would dream of doing this and this is possible, but then what's reality? So I need to bring these two parts together. I usually tend to try and live in this uh, dream world, but also look at this uh, more realistic and pragmatic world. We have this uh, History Museum of Catalonia. It belongs to the Ministry of Culture, and it's located in Barcelona. Well, this is the practical application of augmented reality. What have we done there? Let me tell you about it. We have created an app for um, smartphones and tablets. It's free. It will be launched in October. We have finished the development stage. It will be on the Apple stores and Android stores. You can download it freely. And you can use it inside the museum in four locations, uh, four specific locations, not all around the museum, but only in four specific spots. To give you an example, there is a weapon, a crossbow, and uh, at a given place in the museum, and you see how the strings are tensed and so on. Um, for instance, children don't know how this is used. Uh, they don't know how the crossbow was used in the past, and you can't touch it. So with this app, you can see that. Or, for instance, we also have a tainted glass stained glass. Sometimes you don't have the natural light, the sunlight going through the stained glass. Well, you can do that. Or if you put your smartphone on a model, you can do a virtual visit with the stream view technology by Google. The Catalan government, I don't know if you're aware of that, is the only inst institution that has a Google Tracker uh, rucksack, and we're going all around Catalonia, Catalonia offering this. It's been really costly, but the, the Sagrada Familia 
has been scanned through StreamView. It takes six months to process all the information and to do the post-production part. Well, we have, a, as I said, the virtual visit to that castle, and we also have a location which is related to 1714, where you can see how the troops were moving into Barcelona at that time. These are the four options we have inside the Catalonia History Museum. If I can, if the machine allows me, I'll quickly show you. Here you can see how the crossbow works on a smartphone. Here we have the contents, uh, the different parts, uh, and you see that this is a smartphone. Uh, you have uh, further content without uh, having to include that information physically. So we have extended content uh, from a log logical standpoint, not from a physical standpoint. This is a 3D model. It overlaps. It's overlapped on the physical model. If you remove the tablet from the view, then you, you put it back again. Uh, you will build a 3D model, model, and it shows how the weapon, how the crossbow works when uh, the strings are tense and so on. And then we also have uh, this stained glass here. It doesn't have natural sunshine with the intensity or the dust that you would see when they're in this church. And well, this is the result here. In the back, you see the stained glass as, uh, as presented at the museum. And with uh, augmented reality, you would see how it would look like, what it would look like when, it's, when it was in the church. Why have we done this? Let me explain you. Uh, there's something in innovation. There's a definition of innovation that I really like. Uh, innovation means uh, applying a creative idea successfully. So it needs to work and it needs to offer some value, some added value. This information, this definition of uh, innovation, i.e., applying a creative idea successfully and adding some value, that's what we really want to do. But first, we need to check whether the idea will be successful, it w if it will add value, and we want to be able to measure all of that. And of course, we want to do that with a reasonable amount of money. Of course, uh, Generalitat, the Catalan government, has less money than the Casa Batlló, as you probably know. So how have we done this? We want to assess, first of all, if new experiences in a museum are cheaper by using augmented reality than by doing something physical. So developing an app that you can overlap and you can show content uh, logically through augmented reality, or you can show things that in the past remain hidden and so on. So we need to assess whether this investment to create new things and to enhance the experience is higher or lower than doing other alternative things. But we also would like to test something else. There are some elements in the museum which are difficult to explain. For instance, uh, the crossbow is difficult to be understood by children. With augmented reality, you can make them understand how that uh, weapon used to work. But there's something else that we want to test here is augmented reality can be used also outside the museum. And we want to, to understand when this is done, how it is done, by whom it is done. For instance, children who visit the museum are given a flyer. And if they focus their mobile phones on this, uh, uh, they can download uh, the augmented reality that they've seen at the museum. We want to count how many times this happens, because in the way we're bringing the museum goes out. So there's an app counting how many people download uh, these apps. The Catalan government and the innovation department there is working on this. We don't have any money. OK, you know that. As a government, we have uh, very limited resources. So we, th we thought we 
have a living lab. Schools, the police corps, uh, the firemen, or the courthouses. Okay, if anyone wants to build services for these groups of people, we can lend them the uh, group of people, i.e. the policemen, the police forces, the emergency services or schools or courthouses can be lent out to those who want to test new things so that they can pilot projects. For instance, if someone wants to create an accident detection system, okay, let's partner up with them so that the private sector can test this not on a small scale lab, but rather on a one to one laboratory on the real stuff. If you want to create, for instance, an app for the police force, okay, we do have the police force. Tell me what you want to do, and then we will run this, we will test this with a group of policemen and women. For instance, I went to T Systems, they are in La Salle, and they told me something about augmented reality at the lab they have at uh, the university, and I thought, okay, this is fantastic, but what happens if I offer you a museum so that you can show this to your clients? Isn't that much more exciting than showing this to me at an office at the university? And they said, yes, of course. So they developed augmented reality for a museum, and that's what they have started doing so. Tablets, Vodafone, for instance, Vodafone. We explained the process to Vodafone, so the project to Vodafone, and they said, "Okay, we will lend them to you." Uh, development was done by T System. Tablets were lent by Vodafone. We have uh, added the content, and we've also participated in the development as a uh, Ministry of Culture. So now we have augmented reality that can be tested with very low prices, and. Uh, we are, uh, well, making the best of our living labs because, well, the government has a number of things which can uh, be used uh, for the private system to test things which then can become profitable, profitable outside. For instance, in the in 2012 election for the Catalan parliament, uh, for the first time, an app was um, created to measure results, uh, the results of the elections. Uh, this cost zero. We, of course, have on well results of the for the for the polling for the elections, and they were able to sell that to the following elections in Argentina, and they were able to monetize all the investment which had been done, while they well, while they had been doing this, uh, as we had allowed them to test this. However, there are some hindrances as well, some hurdles and handicaps. For instance. Uh, one of them is the graphic capacity of handsets. If you have a Samsung Young uh, and you go into, into the museum, that, uh, hand, uh, that device is not um, big enough or powerful enough as to run these uh, augmented reality um, applications. Or how can you make people aware of the fact that there is an augmented reality service there? If you're not geolocated, for instance, in the National History Museum of Catalonia, we don't have geolocation beacons for internal itineraries. How can we point out that there is an augmented reality spot? We need to do that. Then. Uh, security of devices so that they are not stolen or so that they are not broken, dropped and broken. Something else for markers, I don't know. Uh, did you remember the crossbow? There are some markers here and they are invasive in, in, uh, in the museum because they are physical. There are some cons then, but they can be overcome. I'll be available for further comments here, but let me just uh, finish by talking about the future. What do we want to do? Augmented reality with gamification, so that you have a gamified experience inside the museums, and so that we can cross out with information from libraries, museums, and cinema movie halls, because you go to the museum and then you go somewhere else. There are other trends for the future. I can tell you more about that if you want offline. And with this, I would like to conclude. Any questions, uh, comments, this is my email. Please do contact me. Thank you very much. Our next presenter is Imad El-Hajj. 
He is associate teacher at the Beirut American University in Lebanon. He also background, uh, and his background is uh, in engineering. No need. Okay, thank you. Uh, I started by uh, telling the moderator that giving a Lebanese five minutes to give a presentation is not possible. It takes us five minutes to say good morning, but I'll try. Uh, let me start by thanking first the EU for funding the IAM project, and that's the reason why we are having this three-day festival here, this festival of heritage, art, and technology, which is a very unique uh, event that, uh, that does not happen very often. So I thank the EU. I thank the officials uh, in Alguero for their leadership on the project. And uh, I would like to mention Leanne and uh, on her efforts on pushing us for the last couple of years to do what we've done in this project. I also want to thank uh, the government of Catalan and uh, Girona here for hosting us. Uh, so uh, that said, uh, let me start by giving you a couple of ideas of what we're doing at the American University of Beirut. I'm representing a very large team, so this is by no means my work. I'm just the one that gives the, um, the supervision, one of the people that is supervising, and there's actually a lot of people doing the actual work. There are two things that we are interested in in the part of this IAM project. First one is the reconstruction of artifacts, historical artifacts that have been damaged, and using augmented reality to present that in a unique way. I'll show the video. And the other one is the reconstruction of structures, which is a bit more challenging because typically these are outdoors. So techn te the technology to working with the different lighting conditions, that becomes a bit more difficult. So in the context of a museum, things technically are usually a bit easier because the environment are, is more controlled, the lighting conditions are more controlled, so what we can do usually is more robust than what we can do uh, outdoors in an open environment. But let me start by showing you the first part of the project that we did about a year ago, which provides us the capability to actually augment these artifacts. And what we were interested in is developing something on the mobile apps using existing technologies and modifications of existing technologies to be able to take something that is actually damaged, scan that object, get a 3D image of it, and be able to fix that and show the augmentation of that system. Here we're showing uh, this object that is actually broken and it's being scanned. This is to create uh, a 3D model of it. Once the 3D model exists, you notice that broken part of the object. And the, when we refer to augmentation, the idea is how could we reconstruct that? And so we can go with a 3D reconstruction of it. And as you can see, now the object is not is not broken anymore, it's fixed. And what, it interested in, what we're interested in doing is that you experiencing this reconstruction in real time using a portable phone. So you notice here in this spot, you could see we intentionally did not hide it very well. And I think one of the part in augmentation that is important is actually not to do the, the reconstruction in a very good way so that the historical accuracy is lost. We want to show the damage and show you what the reconstruction is and not try to actually hide that reconstruction. So uh, that is the idea, and we've seen the technology. What we're uh, interested in is that once this technology becomes mainstream, which is Google Glass are not yet mainstream and are not available to everybody, then this is the device that will actually can be used to experience this and not using only uh, your phone. Let me move to the next video, which is the reconstruction of a structure, which is the main uh, the main objective of the project, and this is the, the Roman amphitheater in, in Byblos, in Jbeil. Uh, it's a very unique site that uh, we encourage all of you to actually visit. Don't worry, Lebanon is, is not that dangerous as the news is, is telling you. Uh, uh, and what we're interested in is actually to do the, re, uh, the reconstruction and see how that amphitheater existed. And the challenge in projects like this is actually the content. How can we get a historically accurate representation of the 3D structure? Knowing that this amphitheater actually was moved during history. And as we know, once these things get moved, do not get duplicated 100% the way they actually were where they were. So we actually had a lot of effort from the architects on the team and the historians to try to reconstruct this while maintaining the historical accuracy 
and adapting to reality. So this is history meeting reality uh, uh, issue here. So we have the reality on the ground is not meeting how this amphitheater actually was back in the days because it was not structured properly. So what exists is not exactly what it was. And, um, and I think we did a decent job. This here, we're just demonstrating here how we are scaling the model, the 3D model, to fit the actual model on the ground. And this is two parts of this project. You can either take uh, a device and go on site and view this and view the augmentation in reality, and this is what we call augmented reality, or we can go fully virtual uh, using the, uh, the goggles that were shown in the morning, and, I, uh, and I'll slip in an ad here. I, uh, I encourage you to go see this demonstration here next door that we have that Rani is presenting. He's the one that actually did all the work on the virtual reality. And you can actually uh, experience the, the amphitheater, and you can go through it and see the augmentations, go up the stairs, go down the stairs, in all immersed 3D environment. And this is here, again, showing the 3D model of the existing site, and then you'll see the augmentation of the site, and then you'll see the navigation. So this part here that we are recording and showing you, you can actually experience here just next door in the break. If you go there and, and you, you find Rani, he can actually show you that demonstration. You'll put the goggles on, and you can navigate this uh, uh, in, in a very nice way. However, we just have to warn you that if you get very seasick, you have to move very slowly, or you'll get uh, very nauseous. This is the augmented uh, part of the amphitheater. If you notice, this site uh, in, in Lebanon, a very small part of it actually remains. You notice the augmentation is the big part of it. The stairs were much larger. All the columns in the back, all the theater part of it is non-existent anymore. And there had to go a lot of research on it based on, on different resources with the historians and the architects to see how they can actually remodel this and fit it. And you can notice the reality is down there, the, the gray part, and you notice the augmented part is the one that is on top. And this is Rani's artistic effect, just going through a, a day cycle of the sun and the moon coming up and showing you how the shadows actually change on site itself so you can have a more realistic uh, experience. I think what's more interesting with this technology is not the history that we can present, but the history of the history. And what the story behind the history, and how did the history come about? And I think that's one of the big things that this technology would allow us to do in a very short time, in a very efficient time, is not only present the facts, but presents how we did get to know these facts, and how did we learn about this history, and who found what, and who did what. And, and clearly here, we always uh, blame the Crusaders for many things, and we're blaming them that they took a lot of these stones to use them in building. But that's typical in the Middle East. We, we, we blame them for a lot of things. So um, this tells us a bit about the history of that site and tells us how the reconstruction of, the, of this uh, uh, amphitheater uh, happened. What were the resources? The existing remains, the Roman measurements and geometric rationale, the Vitruvian theoretical model. Those of you that are art architects and, and historians would know what that means. I do not exactly know what that means. And the regional examples in the region that are similar to this amphitheater. That's what uh, we use to actually build this 3D uh, model. Uh, again, thank you uh, for your time, and I hope you can get a chance to go see this. And I forget to thank the uh, translators in the back. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. And the final speaker that we have uh, in this session is Dr. Monfer Janhawi who's managing the Department of uh, Ancient Heritage in Jordan. And he works especially with the Deris Saraya Museum in Sinrbit, Jordan. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm actually representing both uh, organizations uh, that are in partnership in this uh, project, uh, the Department of Antiquities of Jordan and the Jordan University of Science and Technology, where I was before. Uh, well, our pilot project is in one of the important museums in Jordan called Dar es Salaam Museum. It's in the north of Jordan in the city called Erbit. This building is an Ottoman uh, a building, uh, which means historic one. 
And when the Department of Equities uh, got the decision or take the decision to convert it or to own it first from the police because it was a gel and to be converted into a museum, that was in 1995. It was a big change in politically how to deal with this historic building, although it was not covered by the law of, of antiquities in Jordan, it means it's not, it was not protected. This is uh, a shot to the building. As I mentioned, it is this, um, this project is a joint project between Jordan University of Science and Technology and DOE. And when Leanne was starting to build up a consortium for this project, many phone calls between me and her about this, about actually our intention, whether we have the intention to get into this project or not. And in that time, I was talking to my colleagues, Dr. Ahmed, who is here now, he's the vice dean of the School of Architecture, and Dr. Rami Gharaibi, who was, uh, or he is, uh, who is in uh, the IT faculty, and my colleagues in the Department of Equities that we need a pilot site to apply this project on, and later on we decided to take, the, to take this building, which is now a museum. The historical background of this building, the, the issue and uh, the theme when, was, when this building was converted into a museum, actually that this building should be one of the objects. The building itself is a nice one, and uh, because of the too many archaeological sites in Jordan that covers only what has been built before 1750, so a lot of historic buildings are demolished under the impact of development. So we need to show that this building should be uh, saved, protected. And when this project comes, I, we were thinking how can uh, be uh, fit with the nowadays um, themes and the theories that deals with sustainable tourism and non-destructive techniques and uh, dealing with augmented reality and virtual reality. This is a very nice technique where it is informative, it gives the message, it enhances people to support the protection of these buildings or its uh, contents like the archaeological objects by which you are doing nothing from physically as, as a destructive uh, technique. The building itself wasn't built in, this, in, in one phase. It was seven phases, starting from the 17th century up to the uh, 20th century. So this also was to be shown to the visitors in order to uh, understand that it wasn't being built in one phase or one time. The area, total area, about 2,400 square meters. And here, uh, some shots that shows before and after some corners and during the work, how it was converted. This is the main entrance of the building. Now, come to the, our technical work within the project. And again, many thanks to the team from Dr. Ahmed, Dr. Rami, Majd, uh, Zain, and thanks to the Jordan University who, is, who has a very supportive intention to support leading by, by His Excellency Dr. Uh, Abdullah, who is with us, the financial manager of the project. Uh, actually, we started in different tracks. The documentation first, the, and we, as Dr. Ahmed, was just uh, reminding me this morning to focus on the integration of the, uh, the different techniques or the multidisciplinary techniques we ad have adopted. The manual one, taking measurements, then the 3D laser scanning documentation led by the Department of Equities, and the team was working together. We have two tracks of documentation, and the issue is how to build up a 3D modeling of the 
building itself and later on how to adopt by the IT faculty how to adopt the programming for the uh, augmented reality for its objects. So and at the end we come up with, with the 3D modeling comes from the uh, manual measurements and the, the other one comes from, which is very accurate comes from comes from the 3D laser scanning. And here is some uh, phases of work where we can see this is part, uh, oh, sorry, where I can press, anyway, how uh, the 3D laser scanning in the middle uh, that uh, is called uh, the uh, cloud, uh, pointy clouds, and then the meshing, then the, the toning, and it comes up with almost somehow real shots while it, is, uh, it comes from the 3D laser scanning the process. Uh, here is the 3D modeling comes from the uh, uh, operation and the integration between the manual and the 3D, it was done and still under, under, uh, under uh, uh, reconstruction by which at the end of the day we will have uh, almost a very accurate uh, remodeling uh, of the building itself. Also, as I mentioned, that the IT faculty is working side by side on the objects inside the building, inside the museum. And here is just documentation of the uh, work of the team during the last 15 or 16 months. How we started making documentation by 3D laser scanning. That uh, ends up with, with the 3D modeling showing the, you can see in the exhibition how the uh, parts of the building is shown as referred to different phases. It's a traditional song, by the way. <laughs> Part of the project is, was focusing on the training of the staff of the university and the Department of Antiquities, which was very sufficient and effective. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We are behind the schedule, so unless there is a very, very burning question, I would suggest to have a break now, and we can continue conversation over coffee. Thank you very much to all of you.